we have been talking about what it looks like for us as Christians to be married the way God has designed marriage to look. And the way we know that is from his word, from the Bible itself that teaches us this stuff. And so as we've looked at that, if you have not been here for the last three weeks, please, sometime this week, go on mychurchaz.com and listen to the last three sermons and just kind of get caught up with that. Uh, this will kind of make sense without all of those things, and that's totally good, but I want you to kind of have the whole picture of what we've been talking about. But what we're going to be talking about today is this, and I'm going to give you about five principles today uh, that as I look at scripture, I see these things. And the, the first one is this, all fights, all arguments need to be triangle communication. I want you to think about the last argument you had with your spouse, if you are married. If you are not married, you can apply this to the most recent argument you have had with another human being because the reality is a lot of what I'm gonna to say today applies to all of our relationships, but because we're specifically talking about marriage, let's apply it there today. I want you to think about the last argument you had. Did you feel the presence of God in that argument? Did you ask the questions we talked about a couple of weeks ago? What does God say about this? How would he say it? And how would he listen to it? When we have arguments, this means something. You know what it means? It doesn't mean your marriage is horrible. It means you're married. The reality is God made us different. Men and women are different. This is, I know, mind-blowing information. I'm breaking new ground for many of you, right? No, probably not. But because we're different, we have a different way of thinking about things. We have a different way of presenting things. And if we will understand the reality that disagreements are not unhealthy, in fact, they are healthy. Because when we are communicating with each other, we will find out that there's disagreements, where there's different ways that we think about things. But every single one of those fights, those arguments should be conversations that we're not just having with our spouse, but we're also at the same time having with God. That is a principle that I, I want you to kind of keep in mind. And the second one is this. And this is something that I use in every single one of my premarital counseling sessions um, that, well, at least one of them that I have with the couples that I marry is this. We need to fight together. What in the world do you mean? Obviously, we're fighting together. When we're having a fight, we're fighting. No, you're not. Because quite often, we're fighting against each other. There's a complete difference than fighting alongside somebody, attacking the same issue or attacking the same enemy. But there's very good reasons that training takes place for those who are in law enforcement and everything else to say, hey, you know what, let's not get in a position where there's gonna be crossfire where we can hit each other. No, let's, let's position ourselves in such a way that the thing that we are attacking is the only thing that gets attacked and it's not us. We don't hurt each other in the process. We go after the issue. Every single argument you have, I need you to understand this, your spouse is not the problem. What? It's not, your spouse, it should, your spouse should not be the problem. If you think your spouse is the problem, it's probably because you missed last week when we were talking about the cycle of self-deception. Where you're right, they're wrong, clearly they're the problem. Mm-mm. That means you have betrayed what you said you would be at your wedding day. That you will love, honor, and cherish, which means that that person that you have chosen, you will love, honor, and cherish, which means they're not the problem. There may be an issue in life together that you need to deal with, though. And so we need to fight together on the same team. The problem is the problem. Your spouse is not the problem. Now, confession from Pastor Dusty's history right now. We, nine years ago-ish, almost, uh, planted the church, got started in that process anyway. And uh, one of the best things I've ever actually gone through as far as a kind of personal assessment reality was this thing called church planners assessment. It was a boot camp. Uh, it's not boot camp like the studs of you ladies and gentlemen in here who have gone through boot camp. This was like one week of being in Frankfurt, Indiana, which was really exciting. Um, but we went through and there was a five hour test that we took 
personality tests, energy, all kinds of different things. And then there was a, a two hour time frame that we got to spend as a couple with a counselor who walked us through some of these issues. And one of the first things the counselor said to me is this, she said, do you realize that you win arguments at the expense of relationship? She said, just looking at how you have answered your questions and my evaluation of you throughout this week, you win arguments at the expense of relationship. I couldn't even argue with that. Because as I thought back, man, there have been multiple. Now, what's interesting is she also said, this is not typical in your personality type and in your who you are because you're a middle born. You're somebody who typically has this tendency to get people who wouldn't typically be able to work together to work together. Usually someone like you would be a shock absorber, but you are fighting instead of building relationships. And you are winning arguments. And I could trace it back and went through the process of why is that true? And I came to understand that one of the individuals that I dated actually was engaged to, we, we just argued and argued and argued and argued. And I learned in that relationship to win arguments. Guess who I'm not married to? That person. And it carried over, though, into other relationships. And I, I don't want that to be your reality in your marriage, that you win arguments in your marriage is falling apart because of it. Winning an argument is not the goal of fighting. Okay, and we're going to get to what the real goal is because now we are going to look at this passage and what precedes it. We read that for where two or three are gathered together and my, as, as my followers, I am there among them. This comes out of Matthew chapter 18. We're going to start in verse 15. That is verse 20. So it's the very end of this. It says this, If another believer sins again you, against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. What did it not say? You have won the argument. It didn't say that. It says you have won that person back. This is relationship. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, if two or three are gathered here, or if two, sorry, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything, uh, anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three are gathered together as my followers, I am among them. See, this passage isn't just about Worship. It's not just about praying. It's not just about asking God for stuff. This passage ultimately is about conflict resolution. How do we... Now, there's an assumption in this passage. What's the assumption? I need you to, like, plug in here. I know it's darker in here than normal, so some of you are like, it's nap time. No, it's not. It's like 9.20, all right? 9.30. So, uh, what's the assumption in this passage? Okay, okay, that there's an assumed way that they are connected, but what's, what's, why is this passage necessary? It's assumed there will be disagreement. Why? Because where two or three are gathered, there are two or three different opinions. We know this. We get this. But we like the last passage, and we kind of, avoid the first part and say, I don't really want to do the conflict resolution the way Scripture tells me to. I just want to come to church. I want to raise my hands and I want to worship God. Guess what? You don't get to worship God when there's conflict in your life because when you have conflict with other people, you are not at peace with God. It is absolutely impossible to say, I love God, but that person over there, nope, I don't like them. I have an issue with them. And I'm right in having an issue with them because do you know what they did? You are wrong right there. Do they know what they did? Have you gone and talked to them? Because the instruction is to go to them one-to-one -one and say, hey, there's an offense between us and I need to share it with you because you may be unaware of it. 
Nowhere in here does it say, go build a team of fellow attackers and go tell that person how wrong they are. Not unless you've already actually had the conversation with them one-on-one, -on -one, and then you take maybe one or two other people. But we just want to come, and we want worship to be awesome. And I, I want worship to be awesome. But the reality is this. We as a church, let me make it a little bit more personal. You as a married person will have some blockage in your ability to worship when there are barriers in your relationships with other people. Part of who we are as a church is that first we remove barriers, we love God and people, we serve and give together. If we are not actively, intentionally removing barriers between ourselves and other people, and the barriers are ways that they have hurt us or maybe ways that we have hurt them, worship will be a dry thing that you watch from where you're sitting and Victor will be up here praising God with the worship team and you'd be going, hmm, kind of wish there was more to this. Guess what? There's more to it. But the reality is if we don't deal with the crud in our lives, there's crud in our lives, people. There's, there's no two ways about that. Things happen around us. Sometimes bad decisions get made. How do we deal with those? How do we process that stuff? This is where we need to be paying some attention here. This is the third principle. When it comes to your marriage, when it comes to the right and healthy relationship that God desires you to have, you are getting permission from your pastor, me, right now, to do this. Actively defend your marriage. Fight for it. Defend it by making sure that nothing, no one, has the ability to encroach on your relationship. We sing this song, He is Jealous for Me. That's not okay. We're not supposed to be jealous, right? Um, hmm. I'll tell you what. Any of you guys hit on my wife? <laughs> I will hope that the Holy Spirit represents you because I don't want to at that point, okay? I, I'm going to protect my wife. And I don't do that just by punching some guy that comes up closer. No, here's, here's how I protect my wife as well. My dad taught me something early on in ministry. He said, you need to learn this. This will protect your marriage. It's called a pastor hug. Not a full frontal now, sometimes people come in hot and it's like, I'm getting hugged. Oh my goodness. And I get that. <laughs> but when it's an intentional type of thing, and you, you, please don't evaluate every single hug I give you from here on out. I'm just sharing something <laughs> with you that I do full frontal hugs on my wife and my mom and my sister and my daughter because I want to defend my marriage. I don't want anybody to have a thought that, oh my goodness, pastor's hugging the snot out of her. No, well, that's his wife. Good, that's great. I don't want anybody else having the ability to even think. Do you, what healthy boundaries have you established in your marriage? Because ladies, your emotion should only be going towards one man. Gentlemen, your emotion, your physicalness should only be going towards one woman. How we connect with other humans on this planet says a lot about how we are valuing and protecting our marriage. We need to actively defend our marriage. Why? Because the goal of marriage is oneness. So here's the thing. Some of these may feel a little bit disconnected from each other, but we're talking about fighting right. Because you will fight. Now, I'm not saying, like, punch each other and that kind of stuff. I mean, Chuck and Linda are allowed to beat each other with lightsabers. That's okay. They've, they've made it a little while through. Hopefully, they'll make it all the way through. But we will have arguments. There will be disagreements in your marriage. Your marriage is not broken because you have arguments. Your marriage is a marriage because you have arguments. It's much scarier when people just stop arguing altogether and just exist in the same house. That's not what God designed marriage to be. 
He wants this thing called oneness. So here's the thing, and uh, this is something that I use, again, in my premarital counseling, in my marriage counseling, when there are people that come and they're having issues in their marriage, and we walk through some of these things at a little bit deeper level. And uh, at the end of every single one of these things, I encourage married couples. Here's the thing. When you properly go through the process of conflict resolution according to Scripture, and you are now unified again, and you're like, oh, I'm so glad we talked about this. I'm so glad we have an agreement about how we're going to move forward, how we're going to treat each other from here on out. Once you have gotten to that point, and this is the super, actually it's very biblical, but not super spiritual reality, I tell couples this, bang it out. Three of you got that. <laughs> Your pastor just told you when you get done with an argument and you have unification in your marriage again, have sex. Guess who made it? God did. He did a good thing. And it's, it shouldn't just be this, well, okay, we're on the same page again, so see you later. I'm going to fries. No, like, it should be a unification that is mental, emotional, spiritual, and guess what? Physical. Seal the deal. It's good, it's healthy, it's right. Now it may not be right in the moment if you're having that conversation and you figure it all out in fries, go home first. <laughs> but understand that the reality of what God has made marriage for is for us to be one, to be unified. Now, remember back a couple of weeks when we talked about the reality of what Christ does with His church, His bride. He sacrifices everything. He actually, in this process of being one, he makes his bride holy. When our marriages are right, when you and your husband or you and your wife are right together, there will be an aspect of worship when you come to church that you are more ready for than you have ever been in your life. And you don't just have to watch Victor worship God. You can join the worship team as they are worshiping God. But here's the thing. We like to come in and we like to worship God and we like to look like, put all the stuff on. No, my life's great. No, if it's not, we need to deal with it. And worship is can sometimes be exactly like sex is within marriage because I know a lot of people cover their issues with sex and that doesn't fix anything. Not long term, it doesn't. You were not made for sex. You were made for right relationship and good sex is an outflow of right relationship. You were not made for worship. You were made for relationship, and fantastic worship is a great outflow of wonderful relationship with God. Do you see those parallels, how that works together, that Christ is the, the, the bridegroom, and the church is the bride? Christ makes us holy, invites us into oneness with himself, which we're going to celebrate here in just a little bit. And this is the example of what marriage is supposed to look like. That as we learn how to properly resolve conflict, conflict is not bad, conflict is not evil, conflict is reality. How we deal with it is hugely determinative. And when we process it right, we go through and we fight correctly according to Scripture, then the result should be unity. If your last argument did not end with you and your spouse hugging each other and won again, you didn't fight right. Or at least the fight's not done. Okay? And so I will offer this. Now, I'm not some relationship guru. I don't have my own TV show. But listen, if you need somebody to help you with something, please call. I would love to sit down with both of you, not one of you, both of you, and process these things. The goal of marriage is oneness. We need to be working towards that. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47 says this. 
What's it say in Acts chapter 2, by the way? What, what, what happens in Acts chapter 2? Class participation time, feedback. What happens in Acts? I know I've like frozen you all like deer in the headlights. You're like, oh shoot, he asked me a question about the Bible. It's okay. What happens in Acts? After Jesus dies, is resurrected, goes to heaven, I says, I will send you a helper. Right? So what happens in Acts? The Holy Spirit comes. Good. Right after that, this happens. All of the, de all of the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared money with, with those in need. They worshiped together in the temple each day. By the way, those of you that might think that the church like just asked way too much of you, we don't meet together each day. <laughs> but the reality is when there's the kind of unity that is taking place here, we want to be together. It's not like, oh, I got to go to church. I get to go to church. I get to go to Bible study. I get to go to my small group. I cannot wait to be with these people who are united with me in their love of Jesus Christ. They worshiped together in the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared the meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. This reality happens because of one thing, one person, actually. Why did this take place? Was it because the apostles were so awesome and united in how wonderful they thought everything could be? Is that why it happened? Was it positive thinking that got them to this point? Why did this happen? This is me being quiet, you talking time. Why did this happen? What was present here that wasn't present before? Holy Spirit. God himself among the people. So here's the fifth principle for you. Be encouraged by God's presence in your marriage. If you are a Christian, if you have invited God to be part of your life, if you have invited him to be part of your marriage, then this should be one of the most encouraging realities in your life, that in the midst of our arguments, God is with us. Where two or three are gathered together and they're probably fighting according to the passage. This isn't just some like, we're all gathered together because everything's so good and it's wonderful. God's going to do anything we want because we're here in his name. It's not what it's talking about. It's saying we have come together, we have disagreement, but God is with us. And if God is with us, it doesn't matter what the issue is, we will come to resolution and unity if we are following him. There is hope for your marriage no matter how bad it is if you are following God, not manipulating but following, submitting your will to God. I want this to be encouraging, not just heavy. I want this to be a reality that you go, wow, I never really thought of it this way, that when we are arguing, if we invite God into it, we won't just skip ahead to the bang it out part. We will actually work it out with God, submitting our wills to him, because guess what? God designed your marriage. He has a phenomenal idea of what your marriage should look like. And he wants that to be the reality of your marriage. So we should be encouraged by God's presence in our marriage. So let him in. Let him be the one that unifies you and your wife, husbands, let him be the one that unifies you and your husband, wife. 
without him, I, 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 I don't know how non-Christians stay married. I don't. It is befuddling to me. Many do. Good on them. Good work. But the reality of getting through life alone, oh, that's hard. Getting through life with my wife, that's a little bit better, but that brings its own set of issues. But when I have my wife and God and we are in this covenant relationship with each other, that's good. We can face anything together. You can face anything if God is there with you. And I promise you this, he's there with you. But he never forces himself on you. He doesn't. He'll show you. He'll tell you. He will whisper it in your ear, but he will not make you submit yourself to him. He doesn't do that. He encourages it, but he won't make you. We have an opportunity today to say, God, not only do I acknowledge your existence, but I want you in our marriage. I want you in every single relationship of my life. And here's the thing. If you're not married, cool. Please apply this still because if you are a Christian, every relationship you are in, you bring the Holy Spirit to the table. Which means every relationship you have, whether it's with a boss that you hate or a coworker that is constantly undermining you, you are bringing the Holy Spirit into that situation. And if the Holy Spirit is with you, there can be unity. Not just limited to marriage, but my goodness, let's have our marriages be a bright and shining example of what it means to be able to fight and come to resolution because God is in the middle of it. I want your marriages to rock. I I'm not saying this to be weird. I, I want this. I want you to have the best emotional relationship you can, the best spiritual relationship you can, the best physical relationship that you can in your marriage. Absolutely. Until you both stop breathing, I am blown away at the fact that my grandparents, my granddad died at 93, two years after grandma died. He had a hard time for two years, and he wanted to date. Why? Because he knows that God made him and it wasn't good to be alone. And their entire marriage, they spooned every single night. He couldn't fall asleep for three months because she was gone. That's great. I want to be there when I'm 93. Jamie will be significantly younger, still five years. <laughs> and I, I want that. I want my grandkids to be able to look at their grandma and grandpa and say, that's what I want my marriage to be like the entire time. Now, I know they had ups and downs as well. We have ups and downs. But the reality is God is with us. God is with you. Allow him to lead. Part of that is acknowledging what he has already done to forgive you, to forgive your wife, forgive your husband. We're celebrating communion this morning and not by accident, by intention. This wasn't just scheduled a long time ago. This was something that, as I was preparing for this Sunday, I want us to celebrate communion. What is communion? Communion is being one with God and each other. As a church, we are one body. Guess what? Within your marriage, according to Scripture, the two shall become one flesh. This is not just talking about sex. It's talking about the entirety of what God has designed it to be. We are to be one body, the bride of Christ, unified with him. But we have to do the necessary things of resolving conflict in order to celebrate that rightly. And so this morning, I want to give you the opportunity that if you need to have a conversation with your husband or your wife before you come up and celebrate communion with God, please don't just come up and take a cracker and take the juice and go back to your seat and be like, yeah, did communion, that was great. No, the purpose of this is to amplify unity between yourself, your spouse, and God. If you're not yet married, 
amplify unity between yourself and God in this time. Intentionally deal with the garbage that might be in place. If you need to come to the altar before you come and receive communion and confess something, if you need to drag your husband or your wife up to the altar and confess something to them and begin the process of dealing with crud, excellent. Do that, please. And then come receive communion. And then let's worship God in song, but in spirit as well. This is what I want. And so how, that, how this is going to happen is I'm going to have my ushers come up here in just a little bit. We're going to prepare the table. They will be up here when you are ready. Come up, receive the elements, and take them at your leisure. That means if you need to go to the altar and receive communion there, you can do that. If you want to take it right here where you receive them, that's fine. If you want to take it back to your seat, that's great. If you need to go into one of the side rooms and have a conversation that you don't want the rest of the world to hear, great. Have that conversation and then take communion together. Am I making sense? I have four head nods, so we're in good shape. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time. I thank you for what you have laid out for us in your word that helps us not just have a vague idea about what you think marriage should look like. Jesus, you have lived this out for us. God, you have revealed from Genesis through to Revelation your desire for relationship. And God, I pray right now that you would do the work necessary in each one of the marriages that are represented here today, that if there are conversations that need to happen, then God, lead those conversations. Let each participant ask the question, how would God say this? What does he think about this? And how would he receive it? God, teach us how to have arguments, how to resolve conflict with you at the center of the conversation. Lord, I pray for healing in the marriages represented here. I pray for marriages that have not even taken place yet. God, for those in this room that are single, God, you have a plan and is a good one. I pray, Lord, that you will give them strength as they wait on you, as they wait on who you have for them. And God, for the married couples in this room, Lord, I ask for your strength, your patience, your healing. God, bring them together in a unity that they may not have known previously, or maybe they knew it before, but because of circumstances have lost that unity. God, that's not your desire. You've designed marriage to be a phenomenal reality, a gift from you to us. And so, Lord, teach us how to love the way you love. And God, as we come this morning for communion, prepare our hearts that, God, we could be one with you in a way that is fresh and new every single morning. God, you are good. We praise you and we thank you. Amen.